Up next, we have Dr. Girish Kumar, who is currently working as the professor and HOD of the Department of Emergency Medicine, Ames Kochi. He's a pioneer in the field of emergency medicine with various national and international publications, along with authorship of multiple books in medicine for both UG and PG courses. Over to you, Girish, sir. Now, let us discuss about sepsis management in emergency room. We know that one of the commonest case which is presented to emergency room is sepsis and related complications. We know that diabetes is one of the common diseases uh, we come across both in OPDs and emergency room or ICU. Diabetes is one of the common causes for sepsis in our country. So, we will see how to manage sepsis in emergency room. Sepsis is clinically defined as it's a syndrome characterized by inflammatory response due to an infection or immune dysregulation. Then it leads to microcirculatory derangement and end organ dysfunction. Most of the time this sepsis is due to bacteria. It can be gram negative and gram positive. It can be due to fungus. It can be due to virus. So, so many organisms can induce sepsis, but uh, generally we think that sepsis can be produced by only bacteria. It is gram negative. It is not like that. Any organism can produce sepsis and the toxins which can be produced by this bacteria can produce toxemia. Sometimes bacteria number may be minimal, but the toxins produced are maximal. So, toxemia also common. Then a dysregulation in our immunity can produce increased inflammatory response against, a, against an infection that also can contribute to sepsis sometimes. Patients with septic shock is defined as hypotension. Then initially when there is hypotension, we try to treat the patient with uh, IV fluids. So, if the patient does not respond to IV fluids and they require vasopressors to maintain mean arterial pressure more than 65 millimeter of mercury, then we can call it as septic shock. Any patient who is having fever or sepsis can have hypotension. When we give fluids, most of them uh, respond to that. If they are not responding to that and if they require vasopressors to maintain mean artery pressure more than 65, then we can call it as septic shock. Most of these patients will have high lactate because of uh, internal organ hyperperfusion. Then lactate also come into consideration to make a diagnosis of septic shock. Mortality of uh, this type of uh, presentation like uh, uh, septic shock is more than 40% when if we are not able to treat properly. So, it is very, very important that to make a diagnosis of septic shock in this type of conditions. Now, you can see whenever there is an infection, especially when the patient goes to sepsis and septic shock, there will be one important mechanism which produces all the complications. This is vascular leak. You can see here the chart, inadequate per perfusion, cell hypoxemia, energy deficit, lactic acid accumulation, metabolic acidosis, cell membrane dysfunction and failure of sodium pump, intracellular uh, lysosomes release digestive enzymes, toxic substances enter to the circulation, then capillary endothelium is damaged. That is very important. When the patient's capillary endothelium is damaged, there will be small, small openings in the blood vessel that can produce vascular leak. This is one of the important uh, pathophysiology of septic shock. So, intravascular volume will be depleted through this vascular pores and it may go outside the intravascular compartment. Now, septic shock, we have already discussed what is septic shock. Uh, we can again tell that uh, hypotension is there. Depending on uh, the hypotension, we may start fluids or uh, vasopressors. So, this patient require vasoactive drugs like vasopressors to maintain normal BP and two or more of the following prolonged capillary refilling time, 
oliguria, metabolic acidosis, elevated blood lactate. These are the diagnostic criteria for septic shock. Whatever it is, patient who is having shock due to an infection or inflammation requiring vasopressors to maintain mean arterial pressure more than 65 is diagnostic criteria for uh, septic shock. Now we will see the red flags in uh, uh, sepsis and septic shock. So whenever we are seeing this red flags, we should make sure that this patient is in danger. This patient may require ICU admission and intensive uh, care therapy. High degree fever or hypothermia, both are very, very important. Tachycardia, tachypnea, diminished weak pulse, abnormal capillary refill time, hypotension, which may require fluids and vasoactive substances, altered mental status, purpura, macular erythema. These are the red flags in uh, uh, sepsis and septic shock. So, remember, if the patient is having high degree fever and hypothermia, tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, very low pulse rate, pulse uh, like uh, uh, diminished pulse, low capillary refill time, low BP, altered mental status because this is this occurs whenever there is hypotension or due to toxemia there will be reduced GCS that is a bad sign. Then purpurus, purpurus mainly occurring in uh, uh, bleeding disorders and platelet disorders, macular erythema. See these are the red flags in this. Now we can see the signs and some symptoms of an infection. Toxic appearance, sign of dehydration, rigors, seizure, meningitis features, respiratory depression, bilateral lung repetition, maybe due to bronchopneumonia or due to ARDS, uh, tender and distended abdomen, uh, then tenderness in the uh, costal vertebral angle. One of the common case uh, which can present as sepsis is pyelonephritis nowadays, so that is very, very important. Or we can uh, do the ultrasound in ED itself to understand whether uh, uh, any uh, renal pathology is there. Macular erythema, it indicates toxic shock syndrome. Cellulitis mainly seen in diabetic patients or uh, patient who is having already uh, elephantiasis, they can have uh, uh, skin cellulitis. Warmth, swelling, uh, erythema of extremity and joint suggestive of osteomyelitis. Peripheral edema due to capillary leak, but this is not a very good uh, sign in many of the patients because many of the patients who is having sepsis, they can have chronic edema due to other conditions. So, this may not be very important clinical finding. Multiple nodules uh, uh, due to disseminated cephalococcal RS infection, purpurus. So, so many bacteria can produce purpuric rashes like uh, Neisseria, uh, streptococcal pneumonia, all these things. So, these are the common signs and symptoms of infection. So, somebody is having fever with any sign of infection, you know, if the patient is having hypotension, then you have to suspect about sepsis and septic shock. Now, whenever a patient comes to emergency room with septic shock, we may not get uh, time to take a very detailed history from the patient. So, we have only one to two hours to act. So within that one to two hours, they are called as, uh, so most of the time we call it as golden hours. So within one to two hours, if we are not acting or if we are not able to act or we are wasting time for so many investigations or detailed history taking, then we are losing that golden hours. So we have to act very fast in emergency room. Uh, so take a brief history, start treatment immediately. So, we have to diagnose septic shock. I al already told what is septic shock. Somebody is having in infection and if they develop hypotension, start fluid immediately uh, and you have to monitor the patient when we are giving fluid. Then if the patient require vasopressors, then that is septic shock. Immediately, once the patient come to ER, take care is airway, breathing and circulation. ABC should be taken care. So, see oxygenation and if oxygenation is good, we have to put two large bore IV cannulas. Then start fluids. If fluid therapy patient does not improve, start vasopressors. Then steroids we will discuss in detail. 
then as soon as possible we have to start empiric antibiotic uh, therapy and empiric antimicrobial means it can be antibiotic anti fungal or anti uh, viral whatever it is so depending on the clinical scenario we can start then initiation of vasoactive uh, uh, agents we already uh, discussed so these are the actions should be done in 60 minutes we should not wait too much time for uh, history taking investigation or detail uh, discussions all these things are not possible in a busy emergency room so start treatment then uh, try to investigate now volume resuscitation i already told that is one of the most important thing in sepsis patient is losing uh, 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 fluid from the intravascular compartment so there is vascular leak so immediately put two large bore iv cannula line and start 30 ml per kg normal saline that is best fluid normal saline or ringer lactate there is no major contraindication for ringer lactate in lactic acidosis or but if the patient is having Uh, severe liver damage and if the patient develops a lactic acidosis then try to avoid ringer lactate otherwise ringer lactate does not have any contraindication but routinely we give normal saline 30 ml per kg body weight 2 to 3 liters can be given uh, in first 3, 3 hours then remember when we are giving bolus somebody is uh, telling you to give bolus that is 500 ml stat and see the patient that is very important see the response whether the patient's bp is improving or if the patient develops any pulmonary edema both are very very important so there are some ways uh, we can do assess the fluid status in patient uh, in er we can put a central line and see what is the uh, uh, what is a central say cvp or we can do ultrasound and see what is a uh, ivc all these things are there in emergency room but in a routine setup this may not be there so give fluids and watch the patient that is the best option so give fluid and see whether the patient bp improves or if the patient uh, deteriorates both are very important but whatever it is in fluid deficit or hypotension 30 ml per kg body weight fluid can be started normal saline is the best fluid then 2 to 3 liters of fluid you can give in first 3 hours once the patient's intravascular volume is uh, corrected then you can go for any fluid including albumin albumin is very costly it holds the fluid in the intravascular compartment but 100 ml of albumin you know that it is around 3000 to 5000 rupees uh, which is very costly uh, uh, what is the difference between normal saline and albumin you should remember you should understand normal saline if you give 30% of the normal saline uh, only will remain in the intravascular compartment after some time but uh, it's okay in emergency room Uh, we can give normal saline and fill the intravascular compartment initially some amount of fluid may shift to extravascular compartment after some times uh, if we want you can add albumin containing solution so that more fluid will be retained in the intravascular compartment but it is a very costly uh, affair now empirical antibiotic therapy is very very important so if you are uh, 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 suspecting a bacterial infection or viral or uh, fungal infection in first hour itself you have to start the antibiotic if we are not suspecting pseudomonas infection that means if the patient is not coming from another hospital or if the patient is not on ventilator if you are not suspecting any hospital acquired infection then you can go for empirical antibiotic and no need to suspect pseudomonas so we have to give vancomycin with a third generation or fourth generation cephalosporin so we can give ceftriaxone or vancomycin combination fourth generation uh, cefepime and vancomycin combination piperacillin tazobactam or vancomycin combination like that various combinations are available uh, depending on where exactly is, is the infection suppose the patient is having a cellulitis then uh, you may suspect gram positive infection suppose the patient is having abdominal infection you have to suspect gram negative infection like that we can suspect a different type of organism and we can start antibiotic according to that now empirical tra- uh, treatment of uh, 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 pseudomonas infection you have to give minimum three antibiotic in that one is vancomycin second one is uh, piperacillin tazobactam or carbapenem and we have to add an amino glycoside like gentamicin amikacin or tobramycin whatever it is so three antibiotics are required in empirical treatment in a patient who is having suspected pseudomonas infection or hospital acquired infection in hospital acquired infection you may have to uh, think about uh, mrsa also but vancomycin is there which will cover mrsa 
Now, vasopressors, we have uh, discussed that if the patient is having uh, hypertension, which is not getting corrected with initial fluid uh, resuscitation, we can start for uh, go for vasopressors. The best vasopressing, uh, vasopressor is norepinephrine is the first line of drug. Dose is 0.1 to 1 microgram per kg per minute. IV, it is. it should be only given through central line. If peripheral lines, if you are giving, there is a high chance of gangrene development in that limb. So, try to avoid. If the patient does not improve with the initial doses, you can titrate the dose upwards or we can add another vasopressor if maximum uh, dose is given up for one drug. You can add vasopressin that is 0 0.03 units per minute. If the patient is having uh, uh, bradycardia, you can go for uh, dopamine. That may be a good drug if the patient is having bradycardia. If the patient is having tachycardia, then vasopressin is the second line drug. If the patient is having hypotension because of cardiac uh, 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 dysfunction, then dobutamine will be another uh, choice after correcting the initial, uh, you can increase the systolic BP around 100 millimeter of mercury, then we can start dobutamine. Never start dobutamine as a first line drug because in septic shock, even if there is cardiac failure, we should not start dobutamine because initial action of dobutamine is always vasodilatation further hypotension. So, try to increase the BP with noradrenaline, then add dobutamine if there is uh, cardiac dysfunction. Now, there is another new drug that is synthetic human angiotensin 2 that can be used for the treatment of uh, catecholamine resistant hypotension. The dose is 20 nanogram per kg per minute IV as a continuous infusion. So, at present it is not available uh, uh, in our settings, uh, but it may be a good choice if uh, a patient does not improve after initial line of uh, treatment. So, that is synthetic human angiotensin 2 uh, that is for the treatment of catecholamine resistant hypotension. So, after vasopressors, if the BP does not improve, then we can add. Now, steroid use is controversial uh, because uh, uh, most of the time when the patient is having hypotension, initially itself uh, many doctors prefer to give steroids. But ideal dose of steroid should be given. Uh, so, ideally we give fluids, 30 ml per kg we have already discussed, then add uh, vasopressors. If the patient does not improve with vasopressors, then you have to think about adrenal insufficiency. So, no need to investigate. If we have a, a like good lab, you can send sample for uh, 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 all these uh, steroid uh, uh, levels in the blood. Otherwise, we can directly go ahead with uh, uh, steroids. Uh, normally, we can give hydrocortisone. If the hydrocortisone is given as a, a, a bolus doses, 50 to 100 milligram four times a day, we have to give or we can start it as infusion also. Whatever it is, 200 milligram or 200 uh, to 400 milligram of hydrocortisone is required to maintain the BP. So, we, ha we have to give according to the uh, need of the patient. So, routinely we give 50 milligram IV QID that means uh, uh, every 6 hours we give or we can give it as infusion also. There is a normal dose. Dexamethasone is not a very good drug to con increase the BP. Uh, but nothing is available, we can go for dexamethasone also. Now, we can see the target. This is called as target oriented therapy in sepsis. Target after all these things, we, we need to get a target of uh, mean arterial pressure more than uh, 65. Uh, urine output, that is a very important uh, uh, clinical outcome. Urine output more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, that has to be there central venous pressure at a target of 8 to 12 millimeter of mercury, central venous oxygen saturation more than 70 percent, serum lactate that is very important. Initially, we take serum lactate. Lactate clearance is one of the uh, easiest tool to understand whether patient is improving. You can calculate the uh, lactate clearance like this, initial lactate minus lactate after 2 hours, uh, then by initial lactate into 100 that will give you the lactate clearance. 10 percent decrease in the lactate clearance after 2 hours is a good sign of uh, tissue perfusion. Then septic focus identification and uh, source control is uh, very, very important. So, uh, uh, all these things uh, we have to do 
to understand uh, uh, like uh, whether the patient is improving or not this is called as target oriented therapy so in, when in emergency room when we are treating sepsis uh, we will not be having uh, uh, much facilities like an icu so these are the easiest things we we we, we can uh, make sure that patient is improving with our early treatment so we have one hour uh, in one hour we have to achieve all these targets then patient will improve they, like their outcome will be better so most of the uh, emergency rooms we start all this treatment in uh, first one hour itself then we can wait up to six hours and see whether patient is uh, improving uh, in all their parameters so that will be a, a very good strategy uh, uh, in sepsis treatment septic treatment now once the patient improves we can de-escalate all the treatment including fluids or vasopressors if, if the patient is improving reduce the fluid intake if the patient is having a, a good bp reduce the vasopressors steroids can be withdrawn if uh, we are finding out the focus of infection we can de-escalate the antibiotic everything is possible only if you understand whether the patient is improving or not that's why targets are very very important if the targets are improving we can de-escalate all types of fluids so procalcitonin we didn't discuss in detail but procalcitonin is one of the easiest and earliest marker of sepsis bacterial sepsis if uh, in a patient who is having uh, 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 high levels of suspicion of some infection and uh, for example we have started on meropenem or a higher antibiotic if procalcitonin is negative then it may be something else other than bacterial infection we can easily de-escalate the uh, 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 antibiotic uh, like that if the patient develops uh, uh, volume overload if we are doing an ultrasound abdomen if we can see the ivc which is full we can easily de-escalate the fluids so suppose these things are not there then we have to monitor the patient we have to auscultate lungs every time we have to see whether a patient is developing any crepitation like pulmonary edema then again we can de-escalate urine output is another important thing we have already discussed that if the urine output is improving very good then that is a good uh, sign of uh, 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 tissue perfusion again de-escalation of fluids are possible so these are the important th things you should remember in emergency room when we are managing sepsis so uh, i hope that uh, all of you got uh, 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 the most important steps which should be done in emergency room to treat a patient uh, there are uh, other modalities of uh, treatment like ultrasound can be used uh, echo can be used uh, ct can be used uh, to make a diagnosis i didn't discuss all these things i just discussed uh, the most easiest and important things which can be done in emergency room in sepsis management thank you Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that very wonderful topic. Very useful because we are seeing sepsis on a daily basis. So I hope all the participants have uh, heard it and, you know, improve their management in the ER. We've got a few questions from the participants, sir. Uh, one is, uh, what are we looking for in the ultrasound uh, in IVC assessment for adequate fluid resuscitation, sir? So normally, uh, when there is an IVC, uh, when we are looking in the ER, it's not practical to tell me at all everything in detail here. Uh, we are looking actually whenever there is fluid overload, the IVC will be full. It will not be collapsible. So it, when we are seeing that in ER, we know that it is actually full and we cannot give more fluid to that intravascular compartment. So like that, uh, we can easily we can detect whether uh, IVC is full or collapsed. If it is completely collapsed, that means we can try uh, fluids and uh, we can see whether patient is improving. All these things we can easily pick up in the ER itself. So that's a very good tool, but, but unfortunately, most of the ERs will not have ultrasound mission. So clinical judgment is very, very important. Ultrasound, if it is available, it is very useful. If it is not available, we have to use our clinical judgment and manage. Okay, sir. sir. Uh, one more question is, do we do, uh, need to do an ABG to look at the, uh, the lactate levels or is the blood serum lactate enough, sir? If blood serum lactate is enough, but the, uh, the advantage of ABG is uh, most of the ERs now have a point of care uh, ABG mission. Within five minutes, we'll get the report. If we send to lab, uh, it may take another one hour or one and a half hours to get the report. So easiest thing is always abg mission uh, we can ask for 
venous blood gas also in that also we will get uh, uh, lactate values uh, it will not change whether it is arterial or venous we don't need to prick the patient's artery line just to get the lactate but uh, we always try to take uh, abg in this type of patients so that we'll get all parameters including lactate okay sir another question is uh, we usually get lots of patients from other hospitals they will be given multiple antibiotics so we'll be in a confusion what antibiotics to start sir Okay. How do you go about so that? Here, clinical judgment is uh, very, very important because what we have seen is uh, most of the uh, uh, like uh, patients, they are on multiple antibiotics. Sometimes when the patient comes, they have high degree fever and uh, that fever does not correlate with the patient's clinical syndromes. Like patient will be absolutely normal. Patient may be on, from another hospital, may be on meropenem, continuously on meropenem for last 10 days. Patient is absolutely normal, but still the patient is having fever. We always try to stop the medicine what is given from outside. We remove the IV lines. Then uh, we uh, normally, as a clinician, we have to observe the patient. The patient is not very sick. We have to observe for at least 24 hours whether the uh, patient is improving in symptoms of fever or not. But in a septic patient who is very sick, uh, whatever may be the, like, uh, suppose a patient is on antibiotic for last two days from another hospital, we normally, we don't uh, change that antibiotic. If the patient is on a higher antibiotic, we just continue that antibiotic. Then we investigate the patient and try to get uh, some other FOK for infection. Then only we should change. Unnecessarily changing the antibiotic just because he is coming from another hospital is not very good. But one thing we, as a physician, we should remember is drug fevers are very, very common. And patients who are, who are on this antibiotic, prolonged antibiotic therapy, if they are coming with just fever and there is no other clinical finding, just stop the antibiotic, wait for some time, like uh, one or two days. If the patient is improving, that is good. But in sepsis, it is entirely different. Patient is sick. We cannot stop the antibiotic. Better to continue the antibiotic or clinically uh, search for any other uh, infection. Like uh, from a peripheral hospital, they have started. We have a tertiary care center. A lot of uh, helping hands are there. We should try for uh, a, a focus of infection and uh, According to that focus of infection, we can change the antibiotic. Okay, sir. Uh, any role for QSOFA score in assessing a patient whether he can be sent to the ICU or to the ward? No, it is uh, it is not a good tool for a consultant. It is a very good tool for a junior practitioner who is uh, who is working in ER who 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 will not be knowing everything about infection. So don't, like he don't want to miss the patient, like uh, suppose he shift the patient to ward and should not collapse there. In that type of settings, QSOFA is a very good tool for a junior doctor. But as a consultant, we should not uh, depend on this QSOFA and because they are only depending on three parameters. That three parameters you can get in everywhere. Like somebody is, like for example, somebody is coming with anxiety, anxiety neurosis. If you see the QSOFA, he will be having high QSOFA score because he will have altered sensorium. He'll have tachypnea, he'll have hypotension. So the QSOFA in every setting, it is not good. But uh, as a clinician, we have to see detail evaluation. So like what is a, so like some patients who is saying uh, sepsis, they may not have tachypnea, they may not have tachycardia, like patients on beta blocker, uh, like sepsis. If you see the patients on beta blocker on sepsis, they are not have tachycardia. There's, because of hypothermia, they will not have uh, tachypnea also. So if you go only according to QSOFA, then this patient can go to ward. But that is because the score is only one. So yeah. in that, in, in, in our settings, QSOFA is not a very good tool. But in a peripheral settings, doctors are not that experienced. There are no helping hands. In that type of uh, settings, QSOFA can be useful. But even then, Shifting to ICU should not be depending on the QSOFA score. It's only a prognostic scoring system. We can predict what will be the prognosis of the patient. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much because this is a very important topic. We are dealing it on a uh, daily basis. And I hope everybody is enlightened with these tips. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Girish, sir, for your valuable thank time you. and expertise on the management of sepsis.